And now can you take me through other cases, uh, ones either you worked on or ones that you're familiar with within the program that uh, give you sort of a similar feeling of, of awe or uh, confoundment? Perhaps the one that people always ask me about is Rendlesham Forest incident. Mm -hmm. This was December 1980, and this involved U.S. Air Force bases in the U.K., and it's sometimes called Britain's Roswell, which is misleading because this wasn't a crash, but but it was an alleged landing, and this was a series of three nights. Um, people saw lights in the forest. When I say people, I mean U.S. serving U.S. Air Force security police and law enforcement um, people doing guarding and security saw strange lights in Rendlesham Forest, which lies between the two bases of Bentwaters and Woodbridge, these two U.S. Air Force bases. They thought maybe a light aircraft had come down and started a fire or something. They went out there. Two of the witnesses saw a landed craft, small. I mean, I'm going to say again, triangular, but not flat triangle, more, more like pyramid triangle, but no more than nine feet across, nine feet tall, something like that, in a small clearing of the forest that had apparently smashed some branches off as it came down. Um, they walked around it. One of them touched it. Um, there's a whole other weird side to this story about the guy feeling that he got some sort of download almost telepathic download. Later, he wrote out some 16 pages of ones and zeros in his notebook. And why did he do that? Because he felt he was under some sort of compulsion. He didn't do it at the time. I mean, this was days later. Mm. But I'm getting ahead of myself with this story. He saw this and, and the other witness. Um, and there were other witnesses too, but only two of them got really close to it. And how did they describe the craft? There are some sketches of it in the declassified Ministry of Defence file. It's, it's, and again, this is something some of the sceptics have, have touched on and said, well, you know, it, it's not a million miles away from some sort of futuristic looking lunar landing module, something like that. Now, in terms of what it purportedly did, it seems to go beyond that because after they observed it on the ground for a while, it apparently took off vertically, cleared the treetops, and then shot away at high speed, again with no sonic boom. So that doesn't sound much like a, a lunar landing module or, or, any, or, or even a prototype UAV, drone type, type thing. Mm -hmm. Given that this was 1980 and drone technology was in, in its infancy, I mean, you can look at the history of drone technology and I, I think actually the is Israeli military pioneered quite a bit and maybe the US too, but you can look at you know, the, the level of that tech in 1980 was, was pretty basic. Hmm. Um, anyway, it shot away. There was activity, sightings on a second night. On a third night, again, it came back. The, there was an awards ceremony where a lot of the senior officers were and one of the more junior officers came up and, and like looking very flustered and went up to the senior brass and said, you know, sir, it's back. And everyone was like, what do you, what do you mean? And it's like the UFO is back. So the deputy base commander went out into the forest with a group of about half a dozen people as, as he put it, to debunk all this UFO nonsense. And, and he ended up seeing the thing himself, not on the ground on that third night, but in, in the sky flying some pretty bizarre patterns around. And at one point, it fired a narrow beam of light down at the ground. Again, remember I said about the, the beam of light with, with the 1993 sightings. This is, again, a, a look... In all of this, I look for commonalities. I try not to be conclusion-led about them, but 
there are always some things that you file away and when you hear the same detail in another case, you think, aha, uh -huh, I've come across that before and you can begin to join some dots. So Colonel Holt, Colonel Charles Holt, the deputy base commander, he describes this narrow beam of light firing down actually much closer than the 1993 sightings, almost like a, a laser pointer or something, which is very close to him. And I've met him several times over the years. And, and he's given some interviews on this as well. It's it's a quite a well-known case in the UFO community. It doesn't have the public recognition of, say, something like Roswell or the Tic Tac incident, but it's, it's out there. And uh, he said, was with this beam of light, he said, was this a weapon? Was this a warning? Was this communication? He doesn't know, but what he has said is that it was under intelligent control. And this is, you know, this is a colonel who's the deputy base commander. So he he puts all this down in a memo to the Ministry of Defense because this is these are US bases, but they're on British soil and and then couple of years later, somebody, you know, people talked, people knew that there had been this incident and his friend phoned him up and he said, you know, hey, Chuck, um, we've had a Freedom of Information Act request for your memo. And he was like, for God's sake, burn it. <laughs> he said, this is going to kill my career. You know, the colonel who sees a, a, a UFO, they, you know, burn it. And he was like, you know, I can't do that. That's, you know, it's the law. And he said, well, thanks. You've, you've ended my career. Um, he didn't. He actually went on to get a promotion to full colonel and, and his final posting was in the, I think, the DOD Inspector General's department in the Pentagon. But, you know, it's it's an extraordinary story. And again, I, I did a cold case review. And one of the things that most intrigued me, I said, well, look, is there any physical evidence? And it turned out there was, and it was twofold. There were two strands to it. There were some anomalous radar readings that night. Uh, on the first night, two independent radar systems, I think, one civil, one military, detected an uncorrelated target directly over the base. It was there for a couple of sweeps of the radar system and then it, it disappeared. And again, was that the thing actually landing? Is that what caused it to disappear when it, it just got too low to track? And over the years, a couple of the other, now obviously long since retired, military radar operators have have come forward and, and put some testimony into the public domain that, yes, they too tracked it on their system and, and a couple of them were actually on the air traffic control tower and did simultaneously because they were saying, what the heck's this on the radar? They went out to see if they could see something and they saw they saw lights over the forest. They couldn't They couldn't discern much about the shape of this craft. But again, we have, I think now, um, maybe four or five different radar operators on the record and, and their written statements in various US and UK files on this, on the record. But the thing that was really interesting, because this was a landing and not just lights in the sky, they did do uh, an analysis of the landing site and they found indentations and they found some burn marks, scorch marks on the sides of the trees. And one of the things that they did is they had a, the disaster preparedness officer was, was in this team that went out and, and they went, the first thing they did before Colonel Holt and the rest of them saw the UFO, they, uh, they went to the landing site where this thing had come down on the first night. They took the Geiger counter out there and 
their analysis was that that the radioactivity levels were significantly higher than the average background, or rather, that was the that was the British scientific and technical intelligence assessment of that radar. Uh, pardon me, of that radiation data. And taking radiation of what specifically? Uh, taking radioactivity levels from the the three indentations in the ground where this thing had apparently landed. This mm. was December in the UK and the ground was kind of semi-frozen, mm -hmm. but this object had made fairly fresh indentations. Colonel Holt estimated that the object must have weighed several tonnes to have done that. And, and so the, the radioactive, what they did is they took radioactivity readings from the three indentations, which is where they got the peak levels, from the sides of the trees where there were burn and scorch marks, but also control readings from outside of that so they could establish the baseline and, and sort of calculate how much of a spike this was. And it was about six times higher than, than the average background. So it was, it was statistically significant, mm -hmm. I think you would say, particularly given that it peaked exactly in those indentations. It wasn't just a random spike here or there. Right. And, ju and just to be clear, this detecting device is trying to pick up radioactive activity. Is that correct? Yes. It, it was... Um, it was a piece of kit that they had mm -hmm. had there at the base so in like relation. If, if a bomb were to go off, you could use a Geiger counter to basically track uh, the radioactive, uh, I guess, frequency in that specific place. Is um, that true? I, I'm not a scientist, sure. Like, so I'm probably going to mangle this. But let me put it this way: if there was, if there were nuclear weapons and there was a, a leak of fissile material or something. Uh, you you would be able to detect a a spike, and you would say, "Hey, get the heck out of there!" And, and mm -hmm. we we need to lock this down. Now wow. they also had I can't remember if they took them out with them, but you know the dosimeters, the the little um things that turn red if you mm. get into a danger. I mean that's kind of similar thing. And the way they felt about it was that it was high enough to be statistically significant, but it was not so high that Munro Nevels, who was the guy operating the thing, said, hey, sir, everyone, get the hell out of here. Wow. So it was at that level. Now, there's a whole nother layer to this. Years on, some of those people over all the nights of activity do believe that they have health issues attributable to this. And there have been multiple claims made to the VA for people who said, look, I was involved in the Rendlesham incident and we don't know what the heck it was, but we got close to something and now I've got these conditions. I can't talk about this too much because of HIPAA, um, but some of it is in the public domain and... One of um, let me see, let me one one of the witnesses went to Senator John McCain, and then later to uh, Senator John Kyle, and the, one of their key staffers that does veterans issues worked with the DoD to try and get paperwork on this, and she was like, "This is bizarre." They say that you weren't in the Air Force. And it's like, wait a minute. And so he gives all his papers, all his discharge papers. And, and okay, now they say that you were in the Air Force, but we're not paying out on a UFO incident. And, um, you know, this is, this is crazy. There's, there's no evidence. And then I remembered something. And uh, they had a, a lawyer, some of the witnesses had a lawyer doing um, hundreds of hours of pro bono work on this uh, called Pat, Pat Frasconia. 
And I said to, to Pat, I think, um, hey, I, if, if the VA is denying this and, and they say there's no record of, of this incident, I've got something that might help. And I remembered that in 2005 or 2006, the UK Ministry of Defence had declassified an intelligence assessment of UAP. Not any specific incident, but we did an intelligence assessment, which I helped set up. I'd, I'd left by the time it was done. And it was codenamed Project Condine. And I said, look, I, the, there's a line in there on Rendlesham. And I pointed to the line and it said, uh, the well-documented Rendlesham Forest incident is a case where it might be posited that witnesses were exposed to UAP radiation for longer time periods than is usual. I said, try that for size. And he went back to the VA and said, hey, you know this incident that everyone's denying? There's, there's your file. There's, this is, and this was a, I, I don't know why they declassified it, actually. I was surprised. It was secret UK eyes only, so very highly classified. And, and for some reason, that line had escaped the censor's black pen. But thank goodness it did, because these people got, or at least one of them got a settlement out of that, rightly so, whatever this was. Wow. And, and I remember talking to Senator McCain's aide, uh, Cheryl. I keep having a mental blank on her second name, but she, she was one of the heroes of this story. And... Uh, she she said she'd never seen anything like it, like with the entire medical file. I mean, this is like every senator will have one person that does the immigration, one person that does the, the you know, pensions, one person that does the VA staff. She was the VA person. She was, and she's like, wait, I, I got the medical file. And she's used to things being, you know, maybe hipper, protected, but if you're working with the person and you give your consent, she said the entire file she was told was classified. She said she had never seen this before. Mm -hmm. And she handles hundreds of these cases. So simultaneously the government is saying, oh, this case is nothing. The Rendles from Forest thing is just a bunch of hoopla, but also the medical records related to the people involved in it are completely classified and you can't see them. Yeah. Wow. And, but, and, and just to recap, so this craft is landing in the forest Multiple over three nights, multiple U.S. military are seeing it. One person even touches it. High high brass sees it. They have documented evidence of radar detecting it. They have documented evidence of the actual landing gear actually touching the ground, and then they have radioactive readings up to a level that is unusual, that is statistically significant of all of the areas where it landed, the scorch marks on the trees, and the. British Ministry of Defense disclosed that the people involved with that incident endured radiation to an unusual degree. Correct, although that latter statement was was presented as a a theory. It it hmm. I, I think the the wording was something like it it might be um suggested that wow. that that wit but the, I think the key point was the phrase exposed to UAP radiation. Yeah, it's, because, not, it's not just radiation. No, and it's, it's, it's the implication, the casualness of the implication that UAP radiation is a thing. Right. Not only is it a thing, <laughs> but it's injuring people to a degree that the U.S. government is willing to settle with them and give them money for yeah. what they endured. Yeah, 